All right, hi everyone. I hope you guys are having a great day. So today's lecture is going to focus on the theories of Eric Erikson. Now Erikson is one of the better known theorists, so you might have heard of his stages of development before. So we're going to be talking specifically about these different stages and how his theory is related to Freud's theory, although there are going to be some differences as you'll see. So keep in mind that you do have an activity that's going to be due by Friday at 5 p.m. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions about the material or how you're doing in the class. I do have office hours, so feel free to stop by. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get into lecture for this week. All right, so this week we're going to be talking about the theories of Eric Erikson. So something to note here when we're talking about Erikson is that he viewed his theory as an extension of Freud's theory. There will be some areas that you'll see where Freud and Erikson will disagree or they will emphasize different things. But Erikson did not intend to replace Freud's theory. Rather, he was trying to build on Freud's theory. Um, so first of all, it says you'll notice that he includes extending the infantile development period. So remember that Freud placed a heavy emphasis on early childhood development and believed that your personality was greatly influenced by these things from your early childhood. Like, for example, we talked about Oedipus complex, Electric complex. Erickson is going to say that there are other things other than your sexual development that play a role in your childhood development. And he's also going to say that we should take more of a life cycle approach to personality. The idea that your personality is not actually set by five or six, but more that your personality is open to change throughout the life cycle. You're also going to notice that he will emphasize nature, and Freud did emphasize nature, but you're also going to notice that Erickson will focus also on social and historical influences. So there's going to be a large role of the culture that you were raised in. Erickson's going to believe that that's important. It's kind of the idea, as you'll see, that your development happens in specific stages because of genetic influences, because of nature, because of biology, but then how you respond to that particular period of development is greatly influenced by your relationships. So people are going to be very important here as well. So nature and nurture here. And what you're going to see, and you may have seen Erickson in other classes that you might have taken if you've had other psychology classes, but Erickson had stages of development. Now, Freud also had stages of development, but Freud only had a handful of stages that were mostly focused on early childhood and not so much focused on the way that we change as we get older. Erickson is going to have stages that go throughout the life cycle, and in each stage there's going to be a struggle, a crisis between two opposites that an individual is going to have to find a way to manage. So this is just kind of an overview setting up Erickson's theory. Remember to keep in mind that Erickson intended to build upon Freud's theory, um, not trying to reinvent the wheel here. So talking a little bit about Erickson, and we've probably already noticed throughout the semester that when we're talking about a theorist, they are greatly influenced by their own personal life. We're going to see that with Erickson as well. So Erickson was born in Germany. His mother was not from Germany, but she was sent to Germany to have him um, because he was conceived out of wedlock. And so we're going to see that during this particular time period, there was a very negative connotation to that. Um, and so Erickson did not know his biological father. His mother remarried, and so for part of his life, he believed that his actual stepfather was his biological father, um, but came later to find that that was not the case. So his mother was Jewish, but he never knew his father. So that then led to kind of a crisis of identity here, which is something that's going to be reflected in Erickson's theory, as you'll see. But Erickson felt like he didn't really fit in anywhere because his mother was Jewish. They were growing up in Germany, but his mother was not from Germany, he didn't know who his father was, and so he really didn't feel like he fit in anywhere. So he kind of took off and wandered for a while and found himself in Vienna, where he met Anna Freud, who was then going to do his psychoanalysis. So Anna Freud being the daughter of Sigmund Freud that we talked about previously. So this is how he became involved in psychoanalysis. He ended up attending and graduating from this psychoanalytic institute. So Erickson would have considered himself a contemporary of Freud, so someone who learned a great deal from Freud. 
So there are differences and similarities between Erickson and Freud. So with Freud, we know that we have this id, ego, and superego, and that your id is very important from Freud's perspective. On the other hand, Erickson focused a little bit more on the ego. So he said that your ego is definitely a really important factor, maybe more important than the id, and that the ego is kind of more individual, more like set apart from the other parts of the personality, and that it is very much so influenced by the culture that you're raised in. Now, I think we could all, if we sat down and thought about it, we could agree with this that your culture plays a large role in your personality. So as an example, we live in the United States, we live in an individualistic culture, in a culture where we tend to value independence above most other things, and then we tend to behave accordingly to that. So for example, when we have children, typically baby sleeps in a crib in baby's own room, or at least separate from the parent, Whereas in collectivist cultures, so cultures that influence or they're influenced by like group organizations a little bit more, more focused on your relationships with other people rather than on yourself, your setting within your family, within your community, and perhaps even within your country, um, more focused on relationships, focusing outward rather than inward. So in that situation, we, we're more likely to see co-sleeping. This is just an example, but you can see. In our individualistic culture, co-sleeping is often looked down upon where we think that that's forcing the child to be dependent upon the parents and the parents are not independent from the child versus in a collectivist culture when it's seen more as kind of a, a family unit rather than any one individual, um, co-sleeping is the norm. Actually, the majority of the world engages in co-sleeping. That's just an example of how we are impacted by our culture. There are so many other things we could talk about here. But we can definitely see that if we were raised in a different country, in a different kind of culture, then we might have totally different personalities. And even within one culture, there are subcultures. So um, I don't know where all of you are from, but if you've grown up in Mississippi or in the South, um, you're probably aware that we have a culture here that's a little bit different from other parts of the country. So your culture is definitely an important part of your personality. So. Freud would have less of an emphasis here on culture, whereas Erickson focused more on culture and on relationships, you're going to see. Now, this epigenetic principle here is just the idea that it is based upon your physical, biological development, right? So the ego, the part of your personality that is in control, really who you are, it develops as your organs do or as you biologically develop here, right? Now we know this. We see that as we get older, our brain develops. We're more capable of thinking about different things and our personality does change a little bit as we develop. So we know that you have to reach a certain level of like literally like brain development, frontal lobe development before we can really have a firm personality. So the principle here is that children, as they're growing up and they're actually physically developing, their personality is developing as well. However, this does not mean that your personality is entirely based on nature. It's rather the idea that because of your nature, because of your development, you're in a particular period here. Now, what happens during that period is going to be greatly influenced by your relationship. So it's a pretty good balance between nature and nurture here, right? Okay. So we're going to see that Erickson is going to have a stage approach. Now, when we're talking about this, we're talking about a discontinuous way of looking at development versus a continuous way of looking at development. So the idea of a continuous view would be that we kind of change gradually over time and that we might not ever be able to see a huge change. It's not like we go to bed one night and the next morning we wake up and we're a totally different person. A continuous view of development says that the change is so gradual over time that if you are around the other person every day, you might never notice that they're developing because it's so subtle. On the other hand, a stage approach or discontinuous approach like Erickson took, and if you're familiar with Piaget, Piaget took as well, is the idea that there's this stair-step pattern, that you stay on this same step or the same stage that you're at, and you stay at about the same level, and then at some point you reach the next level of development and you jump up to the next step. This is kind of the idea that you wake up the next morning and like, wow, my, my child looks like they grew overnight, right? They seem different. So there is... A, research here to support both theories that 
development can be continuous where it's gradual and where it's subtle. It can also be discontinuous where it seems like we stay the same and then all of a sudden we have a huge change at once. But a stage approach is going to be more of a discontinuous pattern here where you're going to stay at the same stage until you're genetically ready and then you're going to move up to the next stage. Now, as we said then, this is going to follow this epigenetic principle where your development is going to be very closely related to your physical development. Your personality will be developing with that. Right? Now, it's going to have every stage is going to have an interaction of opposites. So we could see this makes sense if we think about Erickson's childhood, that he felt like he was constantly trying to balance opposites. He didn't feel like he fit in here, didn't feel like he fit in here, and he was trying to find um, a way to get through that. We're going to see that for each stage, there's going to be two different opposite things we're going to have to try to find a way to deal with. Now, there's going to be conflict here, obviously. When we're trying to balance two opposites, there will be conflict. But if we are able to get through that stage in an adaptive way, then that conflict is a good thing for us. It's not actually a bad thing because that conflict is going to produce strength. And then we'll have those strengths to draw from later. Whereas if you're not able to manage this conflict and deal with it, then you won't have that strength so that later in life when you face a crisis, you may not have strength to fall back on to be able to get through that crisis. So conflict being inevitable here, if we think about that pretty much. So then the way that you handle the conflict determines whether or not you develop the strength. So as I said, if you don't have enough strength during an earlier stage, this is kind of the idea it's related to, slightly different, but related to the idea of fixation with Freud. The idea that if you have a hard time in a particular stage, you might kind of become stunted or, or a little bit held back because of that. It's similar. It's the idea that if I haven't successfully completed this stage, I move to the next stage, then I don't have strength to fall back on to help me get through that. Um, now, the stages are going to involve relationships. How you handle them during that particular stage is going to be very important based on your relationships. However, it is biological in nature, so you're going to see some age ranges. The age ranges will not be maybe as specific as other theorists, but you're going to see age ranges here that the idea is because of your biology, because of your development, you're at the age where you're in this stage. Now, what you do with that is going to depend on your relationships, your social interactions. So we're also going to see that identity crisis is going to be important for Erickson's theory. Once again, that makes sense based on his own personal identity crisis that he struggled with his entire life. So, all right, here we go. Keeping in mind as we go through that some of this is going to sound very familiar. It's going to sound similar to Freud. Remember that Erickson was highly influenced by Freud, and he didn't necessarily see himself as someone who was disagreeing with Freud. Rather, he was building upon Freud's theory. So first in these stages, we're going to have infancy here, thinking about probably about the first year of the child's life. Now, Freud would say that that first period was the oral stage or the oral phase here. So Erickson, keeping similar terminology, are calling it the oral sensory mode. So it's not just focused on a child's mouth. It's not just about that, but it's also about other sensory information that the child is getting. We know that during um, those first you know, like year, about a year, children really explore the world through their senses. They do put things in their mouth, but they also um, they're fascinated by things that make noise. For example, they look at things that light up. Um, there's some sensory experiences that they enjoy, certain tastes that they like and certain tastes that they dislike. Um, so they're also using all of their senses here. Now, this stage is characterized by a conflict between trust and mistrust. So Erickson would say that during this time period, biologically, based on where you are developmentally, you're going to have this crisis. But how you handle this crisis depends on your social environment. So thinking about this with us. So children in the first year of life have to rely on their parents or their caregivers for everything. They are not, not only are they not able to care for themselves, but they're not even able to really articulate what they want, right? Really, especially during the early parts of this first year, all they can do is cry. So a baby has to cry and trust and depend on an authority figure to meet their needs, to figure out what it is that they need and to provide it. So Erickson would say here that 
especially mothers. It seems like personality theory is very heavily dependent on mothers. But And maybe you can see if Erickson had, um, he wasn't sure who his father was, he might have put less of an emphasis on fathers. But particularly any kind of caregivers, possibly especially the mother here, if you are consistent with your care for the child, if you meet the needs and you're attentive and consistent, then the child will learn to trust mother or other parent, father, grandparent, caregiver in some way. The child will learn trust. Unfortunately, if the child is not met with consistent, caring, um, attentiveness, then the child might learn that they can't trust other people. Now, this seems a little bit, um, maybe it feels like we're putting a little bit too much of an emphasis on what infants are capable of here. In other words, is it actually possible if we don't even remember, because we don't usually have memories from the first year of our life, if we don't even remember how we were treated, then how can that impact our personality? But it does. It's, it's very important, and we see this sometimes in research on children who've been neglected or abused, or oftentimes this research is done on children who live in orphanages, especially in in a culture, in a country where um, they're not able to get as much care, we see that those babies often stop crying. And so it's the idea that maybe perhaps there's not enough resources and there are not enough people there to care for them. And so their needs are not getting met. They're crying, but it's not getting them anywhere, so they stop crying. Um, it is very important that a child receive appropriate care throughout their lifespan. Now, there is something to note here, though. You have to find a balance between trust and mistrust. In other words, it does not, it does not bode successful for you if you trust everyone completely. There are going to be some individuals in your life that are not trustworthy. So the idea here is that the very young child has to find a balance. Ideally, here, the child would have appropriate, attentive, loving care from parents and then the child would learn to differentiate between people who deserve our trust and don't deserve our trust. And that is protective, right? So as children get older, we want to find a way to have a conversation with them about avoiding strangers, especially not going somewhere with someone they don't know. We don't take rides with people we don't know. We don't take presents from people we don't know, right? So we have to develop a certain level of mistrust but we have to have trust for those key individuals in our lives, right? So the idea is that if you're able to successfully manage this conflict between trust and mistrust, the strength that you get there is hope, right? The hope that perhaps you can get your needs met, right? And that your desires will be satisfied. And that's an important strength to have going forward to future stages. So infancy here, you're gonna see it's similar to the first stage of Freud's development, but expanding upon that. Um, early childhood being the next stage, so Freud referred to this as the anal stage and his psychosexual stages. So keeping similar terminology here, anal, anal urethral, and muscular mode, this has to do with potty training, right? Um, so we're talking about a child who is potty training, but we're also including muscular in here as well, expanding on Freud's theory. The idea that children during this stage, this is probably from about two to three, somewhere in there, um, or a little bit, maybe one to three, somewhere in there. We're talking about children who are learning to control their movements. It's not just about potty training, although that is a very important part of those early years, it's also about learning how to walk and learning how to draw, learning those gross and fine muscle skills, uh, motor skills that we develop here. So there's a lot going on for the child, obviously potty training being important here. And so the idea is that if parents allow children some autonomy here, which autonomy just referring to freedom and independence, if we allow the child to set the tone for when they are ready to do something and when they're not ready to do something, let them decide, then assuming that we're able to do that, the child will then learn that they can uh, have ideas and act on their own ideas and be successful with that. On the other hand, if a child tries, um, maybe tries to potty train, tries to develop these motor skills, and their parents shame them for it, maybe the child has potty accidents, their child, they shame the child, the child might not be able to successfully handle the conflict here, right? So the idea that your autonomy, your independence, 
is a good thing that needs to be developed in children. But once again, just like trust, we do need to rein in a child's autonomy to a certain extent. So it's not a good idea to let children be um, completely in charge. We don't want to be too permissive in our parenting here where children have no structure and guidelines from parents. Sometimes we do need to, I don't want to say shame, I don't like the idea of shame, but more discipline children to help them um, be able to make better decisions. So once again, we have to find a balance here, um, but will would be the strength here that you develop, that you carry on with you, that the child is then able to come up with decisions on their own, act on those decisions, and be successful which is very much related to the next couple stages as we're going. So kind of thinking of this as not like a stay, like that stage is over now, so I'm done with that, but more like a continuous development where you are taking what you've learned in the previous stages with you. And so now if we've learned trust and we've learned autonomy and we have hope and we have will, then we feel like we can move forward here. We can exercise our free choice. We can trust our parents to love us and take care of us anyway. We're carrying those strengths with us. But a child who at this point has had issues might not be able to have that hope that their needs will be met, might not feel comfortable making their own decisions or being able to exercise their own free choice and self-restraint here. And the child might feel like they're not competent, which is then going to harm them going forward. So then we go into this play age, probably three to five-ish, somewhere in there, where the child is... Um, they're not just also learning about their genitals, but kind of in also general, also they're learning to move around more. So remember that Freud talked about this as the genital stage, and this was where Freud mentioned the complexes, the Oedipus complex, Electra complex, the idea that children become really aware of sexual desires. So remember that Erickson is kind of building on Freud. He's not necessarily disagreeing with that. But he is also talking about there are other things going on during three to five other than just becoming aware of your genitals, right? This is also a time during the play age when children are learning to play. They're learning to interact with their peers and also hopefully developing some purpose here, which is going to be the strength, which means that we have goals. We're able to imagine goals for ourselves. This might be the time period when children start talking about what they want to be when they grow up which is really a hilarious conversation if you get a chance to have that. Um, depending on what, what day it is, my son might tell me that he wants to be a firefighter or he might tell me he wants to be the Hulk. I mean, I have no idea. It changes all the time. But um, children have a purpose. They start to set goals for themselves. And they're able to do that if they are able to balance the conflict between initiative and guilt, right, which is going to be the conflict during this stage, okay? Now, initiative, it has to do with the idea that I can come up with my own ideas and act upon them, very similar to the autonomy that we saw in the previous stage. Sometimes parents are encouraging of that, right? If the child comes to you and says, I want to learn how to do this skill, or maybe when I grow up, this is what I want to be, if the parent is very reinforcing of that, and they say, yeah, that's great, let me help you, I believe that you can do this, then it's when the child is going to be able to develop this purpose. On the other hand, a parent who maybe felt, makes their child feel guilty for having their own purpose, having their own goals, or a parent who says, no, you could never do that, that's not ever going to happen, I don't want you to do that. Um, I don't know, this is what came to mind when I was thinking about this. I don't know if you guys have seen Despicable Me, um, spoiler alert if you have, um, but if any of you have seen that, there was the scene where um, Gru as a child, he wanted to be an astronaut and he wanted to go to the moon and his mother's like, oh well, good luck with that, that's never going to happen. And it was just like very hurtful and he carried that with him the rest of his life. I understand um, that that's just a a kid's movie, but it's an example here of how parents have to be cautious not wanting to um, crush their children's dreams, basically. However, once again, it is important to have a balance here where children are not able to completely 100% do things on their own. Um, they do have to learn from parents things they should do and shouldn't do. Then we go into school age, you know, about six is when we, we start school age here, and this is probably going to go until know, maybe puberty or so, something like that, um, six to 11 or 12. During this time period, this kind of corresponds to Freud's period of latency, where Freud said that your sexual desires kind of take a back seat for a little while. Children have a lot going on as they they start to develop relationships with peers, they start 
doing schoolwork, right? In fact, schoolwork is going to be a very important part of this period. So when it talks about industry versus inferiority, this is where children are having to learn study skills and work ethic. They're learning that their outcomes are dependent on the effort that they put in. And that's a good thing. We want children to understand that. And so sometimes when we're talking about parenting, we have this debate over whether we should praise children or not, not wanting it to go to their heads, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a good idea to praise children. Children need praise. They deserve praise. But we want to praise their effort. Right? And that would kind of encourage them to keep working hard. So I see how hard you're working, and I'm proud of you for that. I see that you've sat there and you have not given up. Maybe something was difficult for you and you kept trying, and that's a good thing. We're trying to build industry in children. So a child who does not have this industry, maybe they look at their peers and they feel like, they're not as good at reading or as good at math or whatever. Maybe they feel like they're not as good at social skills. They feel left out. So they might start to develop these feelings of inferiority where they feel like there's something wrong with them, that they're not as good as their peers, that maybe there's nothing that they can do to become as good as their peers. Now, once again, we need to find a balance between industry and inferiority. So, yes, we want children to work hard. Yes, we want them to be reinforced for working hard. But we also don't want our children to believe that they are superior to other children. Um, this is where it's sometimes difficult as a parent. You want to praise your children, but you also don't want it to go to their heads. You don't want them to become obnoxious, right? Probably you know those people that brag on themselves all the time. And it, it's kind of, um, you get tired of it pretty quickly. So we don't want to turn our children into those kinds of people. So we're having to find a balance here where we praise our children for their effort. We also try to keep them from um, feeling like they're superior to other people or having that arrogance, right? So the idea here is that if we're able to find a balance between industry and inferiority, then we will feel like we developed competence here, which has to do with us feeling like we're capable, right? It's not so much that it's going to our head. It's more just the idea that I have the ability to do things. I have the skill to master tasks. And so a child who develops competency during this time period is going to be one that's going to be comfortable taking on new challenges. A child who does not develop this competence is a child who will probably feel like they're inferior, they're not able to succeed, and they'll start to develop that helplessness, um, kind of giving up on themselves. So this kind of brings us to the idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy here, which I can't remember if I've mentioned in this class or not, but it's just the idea that what you believe about something can sometimes become true because of the way you act. So, for example, if a child believes they're competent, then maybe that will you know, motivate them to work hard and they'll become competent. But a child who feels like they can't master the skill, whatever that skill may be, they'll feel helpless and give up, and then because of that, they won't master the skill, and then they'll believe they were right about themselves. So a self-fulfilling prophecy could be either a good thing or a bad thing here. But during the school age, it's important for children to develop competence. So then we move on into adolescence here, um, which is where Freud would say we definitely become fixated on sex again and sexual needs. Of course, puberty does have a lot of hormonal changes that we know um, they do contribute to sex drive, and we know that, and that is an important part of development. But we also see kind of generally here during adolescence that we have this identity issue. Now, Erickson would say that identity is especially important during adolescence, and I think that we could all see that this is a time period where identity is very important, but it's not necessarily something that stops being an issue after adolescence. So some individuals have criticized Erickson's theory with the idea that just because you leave a stage doesn't mean you stop having that conflict, right? The conflict between trust and mistrust can come back up later in your life. It's not necessarily that I was well taken care of during the first year of my life and I learned how to trust and I never had that shaken. Someone who has had difficulties, had bad relationships later on, could definitely see that then this would hurt our ability to trust. So keeping in mind that some of these issues that we're talking about continue to be there and continue to influence you throughout the lifespan. But we know that during adolescence, this is when our ego is really developing, right? We're developing this ego identity, this self-image of ourselves. Who am I and who am I going to be in life? Now, 
Part of this is probably because a child who has not yet reached adolescence is probably not capable of thinking about the abstract ideas of who am I. Um, younger children tend to view themselves in very concrete ways. In other words, I, I have green eyes, I have brown hair, and I like to read. That might be their concept. Whereas in adolescence, a child, or an adolescent now kind of still child, but working towards adulthood here, the adolescent might say, okay, well, I have these personality characteristics that are more abstract, and they're also not just about me anymore. It's also about the way that other people see me. So this is where we start looking to our peers. What do my peers think of me? And we start internalizing that. Now, that could be a good thing if we find ourselves in a situation where we have high quality peers who are motivating us to be successful. This could also be a negative thing when someone is around peers who encourage them to do things that are they're not a good idea, um, peer pressure in a negative way here, or a child who is maybe being bullied um, or being mistreated by their peers. And so many of us can understand that adolescence is a time period that's very difficult. And I certainly don't look forward to parenting adolescents. My kids are six and four and they get older every day and it terrifies me to think about them um, going through adolescence. But this is the idea when we really start to think about who I am and who do I want to be. So this is where maybe we start thinking about what kind of a career do I want or where do I want to go to college or what kind of relationships do I want? So this is when maybe teenagers start dating. Maybe they start thinking about the kind of person that they want to marry, whether they want to marry or not, and that kind of thing. They start thinking about that. So there's a lot of important issues that individuals are struggling with as they go through adolescence. So we have either identity, where we have a firm view of who we are, or we have this identity confusion, right? Where we fail to achieve an identity. Maybe we feel like we're pretending to be something because that's what our parents want us to be or that's what our peers want us to be, but that's not who we really feel like we are, okay? Um, so once again, notice that it seems like with our epigenetic principle, that based on your biological development, you're at the right time period here to have this crisis. But how you handle this crisis and how this goes for you has a lot to do with your peers and your parents and other your teachers, other important people during your life here. Um, so we're going to see a lot of important development here. Now, fidelity is going to be the strength that we are able to, to develop here when we have this conflict between identity and identity confusion. Fidelity just has to do with like feeling like you have faith in who you are, a genuine idea of who you are, kind of what you want out of life. You feel like you're a sincere person and you are behaving in a way that is, you know, congruent or it matches up with your self-concept here. Um, so some individuals just don't achieve this. They don't feel like they have an idea of who they are. They don't feel like they are sincerely behaving in a way that is consistent with who they internally are, and they continue to carry that with them throughout life. Okay? And then we move into a young adulthood, which is probably where a lot of you are. Young adulthood kind of going into emerging adulthood. You might hear that term emerging adulthood. It's kind of 18 to 25-ish. Um, and young adulthood would really expand beyond that. Maybe 30 or 35, right? Um, during your 20s and early or mid 30s, this is where you're going into this concept of intimacy versus isolation, where the most important thing, according to Erickson here, is being able to develop relationships. So if we're talking about this starting at the end of adolescence, so 18-ish, that's usually when most people move out of the house, they move away, and they start developing relationships with new people. It's kind of like you have to start over. Now, for some people, the ability to start over is like a breath of fresh air. I can kind of recreate who I am instead of being the person that everyone else thought I was supposed to be. Um, and you kind of take on a new identity. Maybe you have like new friendships, new romantic relationships. You kind of moving away from your family of origin here. And so during young adulthood, Erickson would say that one of the most important things you can do is to develop intimate relationships. Now, an intimate relationship is not necessarily just a romantic relationship. This could be best friends. So there may be some situations where someone maintains a best friend that they had growing up or that they knew in high school, but oftentimes you end up meeting your kind of lifelong best friend 
during college, your mid to late 20s, early 30s, this is when you start developing those close friendships, probably because who you are changes. Like if you think about who you are now versus who you were in high school, many of you would probably say that you feel like you're a different person, maybe because of your experiences or whatever the case may be. So it's difficult for you to maintain those same friendships if you feel like now you're in a different place. And they are probably also in a different place from where they used to be. So it's sometimes difficult. So you start over here, you develop new friendships, and oftentimes this is where you get married if you're going to get married or you have romantic relationships here. Once again, sometimes people have relationships, um, romantic relationships that began in adolescence that continue on throughout young adulthood or through the rest of your life. But many people end up meeting uh, a spouse or a person that they're gonna have a long-term relationship during young adulthood. So once again, though, you do have to find a balance between intimacy and isolation. So intimacy is the idea that you feel comfortable being with another person, kind of, so not so much that you're who you are and this person is who they are, but more like you're something different when you're together. It's kind of like your self-concept and their self-concept have joined together. It's the idea that you need each other, who you are is completely wrapped up in who they are. Now this could be a friendship, but also often thinking about romantic relationships. On the other hand, isolation has more to do with the fear of that, the fear of losing who you are, your particular personalities and interests and desires and goals, because maybe you think if you do develop a close relationship with another person, you will lose who you are. So once again, we do need a balance here. We don't want to be isolated. Everyone needs social support, and some of us might feel like we need social relationships more than others, but we all need, we're social species. We all need this interaction, but we do also have to make sure that we maintain something of ourselves, that we are not completely 100% wrapped up in our relationship, that we maintain our own identity here, because if a relationship ends, whether that be because someone chose for it to end or because of uh, someone passing away or moving away or whatever the case may be, we need to feel like we can still continue on without that other person. We don't want to, but we want to feel capable of doing that. And so trying to find a balance there is very important during this time period where love is the basic strength, right? Um, and Erickson would say this is one of the greatest human virtues, right? That you have a shared identity. Now, you love another person, and it's kind of like your identity and their identity have fused together. And this is a very important part of development, according to Erickson. So then you move from that period of, uh, during adolescence, I'm trying to figure out who I am. During, like, earlier adulthood, I'm trying to find someone else to kind of fuse my identity with. Then, moving into adulthood, this is when you start taking care of other people. Now, oftentimes, this has to do with your children. So, during this time period, maybe you're having children, or you're taking care of children that you had during early adulthood. So, this is somewhere at the end of early adulthood, 30, 35 to 55, somewhere in there, where, <coughs> excuse me, where you are learning to care for other people, right? And so what happens then if someone does not have children? Well, Erickson would not say that this individual will fail this stage because they did not have children to take care of. That's not necessarily the case. You can take care of other people. Taking care of a partner would be one thing. Also, maybe perhaps you have someone that you mentor, maybe during adulthood, um, you have a younger person that looks up to you, that you meet with, you try to help them. This could be a sibling. This could be um, really anyone that you come in contact with, maybe someone at your work. Um, so the idea here is that it's important for us during this time period to give back to other people, whether that be family members, friends, coworkers, whatever the case may be. Care is the strength that we develop here, right? The idea that we can help other people and teach other people something, um, kind of passing on our ideas and our knowledge to other people, making a difference in their lives. Um, Erickson would say this is important. It's not just important because it makes us a good person or because the individual who we are caring for benefits from that. It's also that it's an important part of our development to gradually go from the one being cared for 
to the one doing the caring. And so for some of us, this is a little bit intimidating, right? You find yourself in that situation where you look like something's going on and you look for an adult and you realize you are the adult and you're the one that has to do it here. Um, for some of us, this is a little bit intimidating because we don't necessarily have a point in our lives where we say, okay, now I'm an adult. So some people think that they're an adult when they move away or when they get married or when they have kids or when they graduate, something like that. But there's no universal marker of adulthood here. And so this can be a little bit scary, but we have to learn to care for other people, whether that be family, friends, etc. here. So what we're seeing during adulthood is this conflict between generativity and stagnation. The idea here that we have to pass on something to other people. Now, once again, many of us maybe think of this as children, right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be children. It's more like just passing on things to future generations and to help society get better, kind of making the world a better place. So some people might achieve this by volunteering or by donating time and money and, and effort um, to help a certain cause that is important to you. Um, Erickson would say that this is an important part of our development here and if we do not find ourselves taking care of other people looking after other people then we might kind of feel like our development is kind of stagnant here where we're not going anywhere we're an adult now maybe we've gotten married maybe we've had kids maybe we've achieved our life goals but if we're not giving back then we feel like we're not actually making a difference we feel like our life might start to lose some of that meaning so during the earlier part of your life, it might feel like the meaning comes from finding romantic relationships or going to school, finishing school, uh, buying a house, having children. But then at a certain point, you say, oh, well, I've already done all of that. So where is the meaning left in my life? The meaning is left here in caring and making the next generation better. Right. So then we move on into old age right, which um, is this next stage here where individuals have, and Erickson referred to this as a generalized sensuality here, um, the idea that we are capable of finding pleasure in many different ways, not just from sex. Of course, when we're talking about Erickson being a contemporary of Freud, and Freud's theory was um, full of sexual innuendo there, but we are able to enjoy other things as well. And so during this time period, maybe children have grown up, if you had children, um, but you feel like you have some free time, maybe you retired, and you're able to kind of pursue things that you enjoy. During that time period also, as we're getting older, an individual starts to think back on their lives. And maybe they say, okay, I spent the right amount of time doing the right amount of things. I am pleased with the way that I lived my life. Now, of course, we will all have regrets and we'll all have mistakes that we'll look back on. But an individual might be able to say, okay, I have integrity here. As someone gets older and they face the end of their lives, which we all um, approach that every day, this individual might be able to say, I'm pleased with, the, with the, I did the best I could with what I had. I'm pleased with the way I lived my life. On the other hand, an individual might kind of slip into despair if they look back on their lives and realize that they're not pleased, right? They're not satisfied. They don't feel fulfilled. Maybe they don't feel like they gave back enough. Maybe there were things that they wished that they could do, but maybe now they feel like it's too late for them to do that or they squandered that opportunity. So um, this is something for us to keep in mind, even though I know the majority of you would consider yourselves in the early adulthood phase. Um, you want to kind of think ahead and think about some things like, will I be happy with this? Am I living the life that I should be living? Will I be happy when I look back later? What am I pursuing? And am I happy with what I pursued in my life? And I understand at this age, we, we don't always know what we want. And we don't always know what we will be happy with looking back on it. But trying to keep that in mind as we make decisions is very important here. So during old age, an individual is going to have a balance between integrity and despair. If we lean towards integrity, we feel like we did the best we could, then we'll feel good about our lives. Versus despair might leave us feeling like we... We weren't able to achieve what we wanted to, and we don't have the time left to do that. So oftentimes when we think about individuals nearing the end of their lives, we tend to think that they're depressed. But the research suggests that depression actually 
goes down as we get older. Um, maybe it's because we kind of are able to have more perspective. We have lived through it and we know that some of the things that upset us when we were younger weren't as important as they seemed like they were. I'm not sure exactly, but individuals typically end up having a little bit less depression as they get older. So it's not something that is necessarily a bad thing. Aging is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, wisdom is the basic strength of older age. So an individual here being able to look back on their lives and have perspective and have wisdom that comes from their experiences. And then hopefully being able to pass that on to others, right? Continuing to give back to their children and maybe grandchildren during this stage. Um, so there are a lot of important things here. We don't want to feel like we ever stop developing, like life continues um, until the very end. There's always a, a time and an opportunity to continue to become the person that you want to be. So that's my self-help talk for you guys today. So critiquing Erickson's theory, um, as I said, some individuals have felt like Erickson's theory um, was a little bit too discontinuous. In other words, that it was a little bit too split up into stages, that some of the issues that uh, Erickson talked about during a particular stage are actually lifelong issues. We see that there's a flavor of that when we're talking about identity, that identity is something that's covered primarily during adolescence, but really continues to be important throughout the lifespan. Um, Erickson's theory is high on generating research, so many people have looked into it. It's pretty high on internal consistency. It's kind of in the middle on organizing knowledge, so based on what we know, making sense of that. Um, falsifiability, so being able to research something and find it as true or not true, kind of in the middle on that. Um, guiding action, once again, goes back to like being practical, being able to help. And there is something there. If you know an individual is doing in a particular age range, then you might be able to help them deal with the crisis. So there is some practicality there. Keeping in mind, though, that just because a person is during, like, for example, early adulthood, doesn't necessarily mean that intimacy and love is the most important issue in their life right now. So kind of in the middle of the road there. Remember that parsimony means it, it doesn't need to be more complex than it needs to be. It needs to be as simple as possible. So kind of in the middle on that. When we're looking at Erickson's concept of humanity here, he does emphasize determinism, right? Remembering that that was kind of a Freudian thing, and he's not trying to recreate Freud's theory, kind of expanding on that. Determinism has more to do with, like, you're going to go through these stages, and you're going to face these issues at a particular time based on your genetics. And so if it's based on genetics, you don't have as much control over it. But he is optimistic here. If we think about his theory, we can see that Erickson says your relationships can help you get through things. The strength that you acquire from conflict can carry you through later issues in life. So there is an optimistic viewpoint here. Um, he balances unconscious and conscious emphasis here. He would say, just like Freud would say, that those first few years of life, early life, is unconsciously dominated. So the child will continue, as Freud suggested, to have some sexual desires, and they'll start to have some unconscious things that are important. However, a little bit depart departing from Freud here, um, Erickson would say that you have conscious influence later in life. So maybe as you get older and you start to develop an identity, then you can choose how you act on that. And so there's more of a conscious choice there, things that you're aware of. Culture over biology. So biology is important to Erickson because biology, according to Erickson, determines what stage you're in. However, what stage you're in is not as important as how you overcome that stage, and that's going to be very much influenced by the culture that you're raised in and the social relationships that you have. Um, and then he did value uniqueness, so forming your own unique personality that impacts how you develop relationships and how you bond with other people and how you take care of other people. Um, so your unique aspects of who you are would be important in this theory. So your activity for this week, you do have an activity due by Friday at 5 p.m., your activity is going to be to think about the similarities and differences between Erickson and Freud. So give me some examples of ways that they sound very similar, some ways that they sound different, and then tell me which theory you like. Maybe there are aspects of Erickson that you like more than Freud, or maybe there are aspects of Freud that you like more than Erickson. So I want to know how are they similar, how are they different, and what are your thoughts on the two different theories? Which one do you prefer? Which one makes most sense to you? Okay.
All right. So that is the end of lecture for this week. So don't forget about the activity. Um, remember that I do have office hours on Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings from 8 to 8.50. If you have questions or if you just want to come by and say hi, um, feel free to do that. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys during our next lecture video.